My name is Keith Cole. Um, I know most of you. Um, if uh, you don't know me, I am uh, have a dual appointment in uh, the molecular cell or biochemistry department and in neurology. Um, I wear a couple hats, and, and uh, one of the hats is director of the ALS clinic here at OSU. Another hat is to um, develop a translational program to see the outstanding motor neuron disease researchers that are in the audience. Um, and then the third hat is that I um, have a lab that is focused upon uh, the um, underlying uh, molecular mechanisms of motor neuron disease. So it's an aspect we're similar to a lot of other labs, but what we have been working towards is, and what my passion has been on, on for a long time now, has been on trying to understand how it is that uh, that errors in our cell's ability to metabolize RNAs result in a cell type specific degenerative disease, and in particular motor neuron disease. And so I tried to, um, this could be a course all by itself. Um, and so I'm going to pr provide um, a context and try to have an arc to this presentation to give you, if you don't have a background, a lot of you already know uh, some of this background, but if you don't, that it will give you a why we think this is important, what's so exciting about this. And then we'll end up with, um, I thought I'd pose some questions to the audience as far as, you know, what are the steps to go from here? Because I think that, like, um, you know, since you guys are the future, you're going to be developing the, the technologies uh, to, so that we can answer questions that we weren't able to uh, beforehand. Um, and for those of you who don't know me, also please um, interrupt me. I love to uh, be stopped and interact. And if I'm not being clear, please uh, please do so. So uh, let's have an informal you know, group discussion on, on these types of things. Um, okay, so I like to uh, I like to get started with my friend uh, Charles Sherrington, who is a neuroanatomist, uh, you know, in England. Um, and is one of the uh, sort of grandfathers of the uh, pathological clinical correlations that were sort of the hallmark of uh, the um, uh, late 19th century, early 20th century. And he, uh, he, he uh, had this very eloquent uh, uh, quote to talk about uh, what we all know and had the background on, which is the motor system. So what he was talking about as far as the final family pathway of the nervous system is that, as you know, there's the billions of neurons in your brain, but it comes down to these single cells that are in the motor cortex in your frontal lobe that send their projections through the brain through the spinal cord that synapse on a second lower motor neuron that goes out of the central nervous system and can be a meter long and plugs into the muscle. And I just want to frame that for you. We're not going to talk about this stuff. You already know this stuff. but. Um, I, I want you to have that sort of bothering you in the back of your head as you start drilling down into RNA processing. Because RNA processing is a big deal. And it's a big deal because we have a fixed genome. The genome encodes around 20,000 um, uh, uh, transcripts when you, you know, just look at it. But in, but in order to exploit and make more diversity throughout evolution, and this can be elegantly seen in uh, looking from geese up into simple animals and then into humans and actually to continue. Um, you exploit that fixed number or a relatively small number of encoding transcripts into the uh, larger number of uh, probably north of 80,000 actual transcripts that are generated from, from that. Um, and then the proteome itself, and this is something that's a little bit harder to actually estimate, but is another order of magnitude for sure more complex than the actual transcriptome um, from the free messenger RNAs and the different splice, splicing variants that, that you have. So this is something that outside of, of, uh, of neuroscience and you know, neurology has been an incredible um, uh, area of basic science investigation to understand this rich diversity of RNA uh, um, regulation and how this can happen. This isn't random. How, how all these things can happen. We're going to talk today about general pathways of how this happens 
and we're going to talk about how that intersects with motor neuron disease. And I hope to fulfill our goal of the talk, which is to identify what the link between this kind of problems that all cells have to the disease state that we are dealing with. I would also note that just sort of common sense might dictate that it's the nervous system that has to exploit the kind of processing events that we're about to talk about much more than any other cell type in your body because neurons are diverse, not just morphologically, but they're also, they're, they're also uh, unique in their connectivity to one another and in their activity because we also know that, that gene expression can be regulated and altered just by normal function. So that's why when I have my doctor hat on and I'm on rounds with you know people and they say that they want to go into studying the kidney, I make fun of them because the kidney doesn't have to exploit RNA processing as much as your nervous system does in order to go through. No, no offense to the nephrologist in the room. So um, this is my cartoon that I'd like to start as sort of a primer because I think you know, this is all basic stuff, I, I'm sure for you guys, but I think that it's nice for us to all start on the same uh, playing field. And we're going to talk a little bit more in detail this, about this stuff. But you guys know that, the, that in order to generate peptides here in your ribosome uh, and, uh, in the cytoplasm, that you need to go from your DNA that is in the, the nucleus here. Um, that encodes these pre-mRNAs that have electronic sequences, other non-coding regulatory sequences associated with them. So just at this transcriptome level, there's an amazing uh, amount of regulation in, in generating this. We're going to talk about that. Then there are specific events that take out uh, specific introns, maybe this one, maybe that one. Also, editing can occur at this time for single nucleotides, et cetera, until you have in a, a, a pre-RNA that is capped, has a poly A tail, is targeted to go into the uh, uh, nucleophore to be exported out, and uh, again, in a regulated fashion, not in some kind of random haphazard way, which 20 years ago even, people were thinking, well, this is maybe just sort of diffusion until you get into the ribosome, and this is also a regulatable step. Of course, you guys also know that it's not just this. There are non-coding RNAs that are made. These non-coding RNAs go out into the cytoplasm where they associate with other proteins. We're going to talk about this little, little guy a little bit more later, but suffice it to say that one of the hearts of this talk and of the problem of RNA metabolism in uh, motor neuron disease is the fact that specific RNAs have to associate with specific proteins in a specific way, and that has to be solved by particular RNA and protein interactions. That's regulated by all these other cascades of the thing that we don't even understand all the players for um, you know, going forward. So I, I'm trying to impress upon you the importance of this kind of ribonucleoprotein non-coding RNA component, protein component. This is the active guide that goes into the cell. In, in this case, this is a spliceosomal SNRP, uh, one of these arabonucleic proteins, small nuclear arabonucleic proteins. And this guy, of course, you guys know that specific ones, and there are a list of them, bind at intron exon junctions, among other things, to say, hey, guys, over here, come and snip out the intron here or not there, block this one, put this. You get the idea that somehow these guys are talking to one another so that they are able to, to meet the needs of the cell at any given time. So we've got processing that goes on, things have to come through. Now, and, but, but the association of specific proteins, we've already talked about here, and RNAs occurs in all sorts of ways, and we're going to talk about uh, about those today. Um, but one example is just loading up tRNAs for the ribosome. You know, then they have to be recognized. They're they're very specific. They have you have to take a specific amino acid, load it up to the specific amino amino acyl tRNA. That has to go in there, and then uh, uh, of course there's the ribosome that is uh, you know cranking out these peptides, and then RNA don't live forever. And we're going to go a little bit more into this. But basically, their RNAs have to be regulated. So some of them have to stick around, some of them don't. The, the purpose of this kind of slide is to, is to emphasize the idea that your cells are like magicians in figuring out how to put specific RNAs with specific proteins at the right time 
in order to meet the needs of the seller. This is going to become important to our discussion later. Another background piece of information that I think is important to, to note is that these kinds of ribonucleoprotein uh, complexes are often sequestered within cytoplasmic and also nuclear concentrations of many ribonucleoproteins um, for that, that and, and, and that serves many needs for the cell. And those are Peabody, stress granules are the two big ones that are going to be relevant to our discussion. Again, on motor neurons, because we're getting there. But these are some of the things, for example, with Peabody's that, uh, that we know. So here you've got your pre-RNA, you've got uh, a polysome on because we're cranking out uh, proteins here from our, our pre-RNA, -R, pre everything's hunky-dory. Then a stress comes in to hit the cell. And what happens, your cells are able to arrest translation at that time and actually sequester many of the processes of, of, uh, of, of the transcriptional, post-transcriptional um, uh, uh, cascade of events. And those can go into stress granules, they can go into Peabody's, where uh, there are proteins that bind and recognize things, they hold them there for either degradation, if it is something that is sustained for long periods of time, in the case of a stress granule, or if it is something that is not able to be unfolded, for example, or put back out, or it's deposited back after the stress comes out and everything's hunky dory. And of course, single cell organisms do this. And this is, and this is uh, as you guys know, this is a, a fundamental biological process. But your neurons have to do that. And we're going to talk about the special reasons that that's a problem, or make it a problem. Um, Storing RNAs in neurons, also moving specific RNAs, because there are there has to there has to be a way. And remember, you've got these meter-long cells. There has to be a way that you can specifically, not randomly, specifically target specific RNAs for local translation. For example, at dendrites, um, learning and memory is a great model system for that, where you have a dendritic harbor, and only these guys who are being activated by those cells translate. You know, acetylcholine receptors and other proteins, so that you're, you are uh, able to, uh, or glutamate, glutamate uh, receptors um, going for it. Okay, so stop me at any point, guys, if I'm getting the glazed over look, then I'm going to just start yelling louder. Okay, so you're with me. All right, so we're going to we're going to change the pace, but remember, we're not just dealing with a yeast cell; we're dealing with a cell that is very, very specialized. So if this this Sort of for this uh, uh, screen was your motor neuron, then the axon would go all the way out to almost Dayton in order for you to hit a muscle for like my long L2, you know, axon that goes through my, my big toe. That's how crazy, you know, this morphological cell is that has to live through your entire life um, and that dies in ailments. Um, so that's just, this is just a transition slide so that I can now give you the up-to-date stuff. I've actually got Burgess feed on this because he gave you genetics, but that was before this paper came out. This paper came out last week. And this is the last, this is the most up-to-date exome sequencing sort of compilation that's been done on a large scale in patients with ALS. This was um, actually a, 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 a collaboration with Biden. Biden funded a lot of this with the NIH and other people. But basically, um, over 2,000 uh, uh, patients with ALS, over 6,000 or something uh, patients who were controlled, and there'll be a test on this after the lecture. No, uh, but, this, but this is basically the list of the, the variants that are associated that were associated with it, and we're going to we're, we're going to go through each one of these in, in granular detail. Uh, we're we're going to a lot of these are already diagnosed proteins, and we're, we're going to come back to this. At the end, once we go together, right? I'm, I'm a little bit fatigued today because it's been such a long. All right. So now that we've had our little primer on our on the importance of ribonuclear proteins, let's go back in time when people were looking at pathological specimens of motor neuron disease. And I think you guys all have had enough neuroscience and neurobiology back back in the day. You know, a lot of the characterization categorization of different dementias and different neurodegenerative diseases um, and Alzheimer's, you know, effect, for example, but also things like frontotemporal dementia and to some extent um, ALS 
were characterized by the presence of insoluble protein aggregates that would occur in the cytoplasm or in the nucleus of large projection class neurons, sometimes also seen in astrocytes and other things we had we're talking about. Back in the day, and the teaching was that sometimes in ALS you didn't see that, but when you did see that, you would see um, uh, uh, inclusions that often had this sort of um, uh, fibril uh, uh, fibril-like looking uh, pattern, um, or it would have this incredibly dense, uh, uh, thick pattern that was positive for ubiquitin. And so, of course, the idea is that you got something wrong with the trash collectors, and you end up accumulating trash, and eventually that causes havoc in the cell. And that's kind of where we were um, at, uh, you know, uh, until about 2006, when a group had, and this is literally how it happened, is a group had a large number of pathological specimens in their freezer, and they were doing a screening of antibodies to see what would co-localize with these different kinds of ubiquitin positive uh, inclusions, okay? So it's a screening type experiment. And then they would work backwards. Once they had a positive thing, they would go identify what that antibody is and see what it is to get it. So they did that in, in front of temporal dementia because it turned out that in front of temporal dementia, um, that there were also these ubiquitin uh, uh, positives. But there, but, but there was a problem in the FTD world because a lot of them were tau positive, and that fitted nicely to the narrative of tau and alpha synuclein and all these other kinds of things. But a lot didn't. And so they identified this protein called DP43 um, and found these kinds of inclusions that were in uh, an FTD. And of course, this was at Penn where they have like these huge freezers filled with lots of autopsy specimens. And of course, it didn't take that long to go screen everything with this antibody. And one of the remarkable things Brian Kassar's case is worth remarkable, is that almost all of the samples that they saw, certainly from sporadic cases, had um, the incredible, co this incredible co-localization with ubiquitin and this DDP43. This was a, uh, um, a, an important pathological hurdle in the field. Yes, there had been progress and continued to be progress on the genetic front. But this was something that was was a um, uh, was starting to get us to well maybe these inclusions are sequestering things that are important maybe DP forty three is important in that regard and this is this is what we're going today with this talk so then not at the same time at that time there were no DP forty three mutations that had been reported but soon after that people started to look and they found that you mutations in this protein, primary mutations in this protein, were occurring in patients with familial forms of FTD and ALS. Okay, so this is kind of a neat historical thing, you know, when you're 50, you know, 100 years from now when they're all laughing at us and they just sort of, they just sort of like, wow, well, we found an RNA binding protein that was in pathological inclusion, and then nature gave us the families with, I mean, they were already there, but we discovered that they, that they have a primary mutation in this. So, this is, I'm going to take a little bit of time uh, to explain what this, this stuff means because it's at the heart of the link between RNA processing and learner neuron disease. And you're going to see this kind of story repeat over and over again, uh, which is kind of, uh, kind of exciting. So TD43 is a 414 uh, amino acid uh, protein. Um, and it has the, th this is called an RNA recognition uh, motif, which has, um, with which, uh, uh, there are there are algorithms that you can uh, write that help to predict these things, but you can also empirically show that these domains uh, uh, facilitate the pull down of specific RNAs that you can use in, in assay. I'm not going to go into all that stuff, but just trust me that this is an RNA binding protein, and, and we know that it, 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 rec it recognizes splicing normal proteins, for, uh, for example. And then it also has this glycine rich. Uh, domain and notice where most of the mutations are that in this protein. I mean, this is a kind of a you know, it's kind of saying that's important for the development of ALS, right? Um, and so, what is a prion-like domain? So, without 
like uh, showing you, you know, structures, I think you all are familiar with free abs, and of course that is a, a cause of rare uh, spongiform encephalopathy that does occur, and I have seen patients with that. They do not look like they have ALS. They have a, they have a terrible the pulmonary the degenerative uh, disease, which is uh, pretty bad. These are protein-like in the sense that they have the ability to self-associate into very stable um, linear uh, arrangements of uh, amyloid-like uh, um, uh, uh, structures. They are enriched in polar residues and in glycine. Um, and so you can imagine in the context of the cell that once these guys line up together, they are stuck there. And it takes quite a bit of energy to separate them out. Um, so why would you even want that in, in a protein? Well, we're going to talk about that because about 29 of the 210 proteins that are RNA proteins have these prion-like domains. It's a thing. It's actually an important reason that they are functional RNA binding proteins. But this is another link to why it is that we're even discussing that today in ALS pathogenesis. Okay. Um, this was a recent uh, study. These, these guys are really nerds. Uh, where where they, you know, they, they've developed these al algorithms. They've went through the whole genome. I mean, I, I have a lot of respect for them. Not my cup of tea, but they basically came up with 10 different motifs that, that would meet the criteria for prion, and they empirically tested those things. Really cool science. Really, really cool stuff. Um, by the way, every every sort of figure that I'm using, I have my reference here, and uh, you know, uh, so. Okay, so so I'm I'm using PDB43 as a uh, at, at, to, to, to illustrate these two these two components of an RNA binding protein that that nature tells us is probably important. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. Does that make sense, everybody? You with me? Okay. We have class. Okay. Um, so uh, around the, around that time, again, people found another protein called this uh, fusion sarcoma that is uh, uh, that also had these inclusions in ubiquitinated uh, tomoplasm ubiquitin in FTE, um, very rarely in ALS relative. Uh, um, and guess what? It has a very similar kind of structure because it does a similar kind of thing. It has uh, RNA binding motif. It is, you can see it's a very different kind of domain structure. Um, it has domains that, that uh, make it uh, that, that would predict that would have associations with other proteins and has places where it would uh, bind with specific RNAs. Uh, and then again, uh, polar uh, residues, charged residues, uh, and uh, with glycine uh, combined, predicted to be uh, uh, a prion. So quite often, unfortunately, plus is sort of like the um, you know the little sister of PDD43 in the literature. I mean, you know, uh, because because because. PD43 was first, but it, but it, but it is a, a, an interesting kind of uh, thing. Okay, so what is I, I've been talking about ALS and functional temporal dementia, and what's kind of cool about this is that now that we are learning more about the genetics of in FTD and ALS, remember that one of the things that I always talk about in clinic is how how uh, heterogeneous the population is. There are, there are people with ALS. And you have no indication that they have any structure of dementia. But if you look, a lot of times you see subtle things. Then there are patients with FTD and ALS, and then there are patients who are on the other side of the spectrum. And this is where TDD43 and PUS sort of landed as far as how often they would be associated with an ALS versus an FTD phenotype. But there are lots of others here. Um, you, Dr. Meyer, of course, gave an excellent talk on c 9 orc which is another great example of that that I'll just briefly put into this context. But I think you guys have already been introduced to the concept that we're not just talking right now about like just ALS. We're looking at ALS as being a part of a spectrum of neurodegeneration that is occurring in the frontal lobe and temporal lobe. Remember that the motor cortex is in the frontal lobe, so it makes a lot of sense that you would have spread to adjacent uh, cell types if that's what is going on there. Um, and so, uh, but, the, but, but what's cool is that these genes uh, on this spectrum also uh, are linked, the TB43 and the PUS uh, here, to the inclusions that are going on. And this, this is the thing. So if you look at the inclusions in ALS, 
the sporadic ALS patients, I mean, there are, the, the TB43 is in there. Yes, there are uh, some uh, cases with SOD where you see uh, actual pathological conclusion containing SOD mark. Um, not, not that common, and rarely FUS is identified. But FUS is rare. I mean, uh, we have one family in the, in the clinic uh, with that. We're kind of lucky in that regard, but worldwide it's very rare. Um, whereas FTD, remember how I said that everybody had in their freezer the tau stuff, but they didn't know what else was going on until 2006. Well, now we know that it's about half and half TB, uh, TB 43 and tau with some FUS in their uh, pathologic genes. So while these genes are on a spectrum of, uh, of the clinical phenotypes that are, are going on, it's the FUS and TDP43 uh, here in ALS, uh, particularly the TDP43, that it is uh, also sequestered in these inclusions uh, that are going on. And I think that's a neat kind of uh, combination between something that may be in completely unrelated to the function of TDP43 affecting TDP43 function, or you have the mut mutation in TDP43, which primarily affects TDP43 function. And go either way, you get that outcome of having uh, ALS. You guys with me? I think that one of the things that's coming out, uh, you know, because remember these are like pathological specimens, uh, you know, fixed tissue kind of things where you can't do the same kinds of of, uh, of studies that you can do in say cells that are expressing genes. But it is true that even if you have in, in culture you overexpress a fuss mutation, and this is a, also sort of an interesting aside, is that some fuss mutations do form aggregates that you see, but some don't. But they still have downstream consequences. So this is something that I used to rant about when I was a postdoc, is that you know the meaning of these is, you know, is, is, is don't just think that that's going to have this consequence. Because you can have something that does not form something that you can see and have an alteration in downstream process of events. There's not a one-to-one -one correlation to that necessarily. So you don't have to have that aggregate. So I, I, I posed the question before, why do RNA binding proteins 
what, what, is, what is the utility of that? If this is something that when you mutate those domains that it causes neuronal death, then, you know, that, that doesn't seem very smart. But one of the kind of neat things about it, and this, I think this is a great review, where they they are illustrating the preon-like domain waving out here like a little tail. Okay. So you've got, say, a preon RNA, you've got a nice half poly A gel on this one before. You've got a bunch of different um, uh, RNA or uh, uh, RNA binding proteins on your messenger RNA, and this could be for for transport to a dendrite. It could be in uh, strip to get to a stress granule or to a key body. Um, this is a, this is sort of a general thing. But say there's a stress in the cell, and like it's hitting the fan. We got we got to do something. Prion domains come in handy. They actually very quickly associate with one another and form stable, um, in the case of stress granules, stable bodies that hold tight and protect things when you know concentration in the cell is going crazy or calcium is flooding into the neuron or whatever you want to say. Um, and but it's not it's not like uh, degrading them, it's just protecting them. So prion domains and this the, 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 the thought that so many of these RNA bicarbonates have these types of domains essentially is the ability to quickly get together, form stable structures that protect it from other things that are going on, and then the ability to release that. And of course, this is regulated. There are proteins that their job is to, either through phosphorylation or through other interactions, are able to, say, aggregate. All right, don't aggregate. It's sort of like you know the music and the musical chairs to say when to kind of do this. But basically, normally what would go is things would go back Stabbing the individual uh, MRMP. And prion domains, if you take away the prion domain of these proteins, you, you interfere with the formation of stress granules. If you take a prion like domain and put it on a totally naive protein or a marker, it goes to stress granules. So the prion domain is an incredibly useful tool. That, the, that, the, that these proteins use to take vulnerable RNA, because you know when you work in the lab, you know, it's always the RNA that needs all the RNA treatment. You know, DNA, whatever, you know, proteins, okay, but it's the RNA. This is how your cell deals with it. You know, I, I, I always like to, I sometimes leave like, uh, with like uh, other audiences out there, you know, RNA is never naked in your cell. And that's because, and, and this is just sort of a beautiful way that that, that it is, it is uh, attended to while walking some. So this is what happens. The problem is that these prion-like domains, because they're so good at the snap, Lego-like, you know, interlocking, let me go this through, can also adopt, you see these parallel things. I, you know, I, I like, I was thinking, should I, how far should I go here? But basically, you know, they really form like these linear rays. You can stretch out because of the, you know, high concentration of polar residues, and they become rigid and stacked. And then they they form just like pathogenic prions. They essentially form a structure that can then, because of its overwhelming biophysical forces on neighboring proteins, can can actually alter the conformation of a neighbor. And stack it up, and stack it up, and that's the problem, right? That's that's when things get a little bit out of hand, all right? This is uh, something, though, that the cells, you know, I mean, we've been evolving for a long time. So, like, all right, I've I seen this, you know. Let's let's send you to an autophagosome because, you know, we're not going to have that stuff happening happening here. And so, we have a very beautiful, elegant system for recognizing these insoluble things. You know, and, and 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 that's a whole other lecture, right? But this is how it all ties in. Okay. Unfortunately, if you have a primary mutation in that prion-like domain, say in PD43 or plus, or if you have something else that is causing uh, a lot of PD43 uh, sequestration, for example, then you have the one that I'm talking about, where it basically is, has such a such a biophysical charge to it, like a stacked battery, like parallel batteries, that now things are just locking in. Um, that's when you have 
a pathogenic, and that's when problems happen. And when we talk about downstream mechanisms, I mean, we can talk about that. People are starting to, to give data of slicing changes. You know, PRO issues like Harper's done that, and that's today we're going to touch on that a little bit. But basically, the idea you guys know that if you mess up this elegant process, that you're going to have changes in the transcriptome and, and then ultimately in the proteome that we introduced at the very beginning of the talk. So not only are you going to have downstream effects that you cannot predict because you could be affecting something that's relevant that is not, you know, that's just being sucked up like a, with a dust buddy, um, but you're also changing the transcriptome and that has unpredictable events also. So, you know, we are at this, and this is my challenge to you guys um, who are, you know, the, the future of, of all of this is we need to pay, you know, we need to be better at how we interpret that kind of downstream slicing and, and RNA processing data. Because right now, I would argue that we are just in these very early days, we're making associations, we're not drawing causality. Yeah. So that, that is, that we're just getting there and that's what you guys are going to be at the front line for, which is very exciting. Okay, yes. find 
I just wanted to show you that this is like a dust bunny for RNA binding protein. RNA binding protein sequestration by by cells, and you can detect it in the CSF. You know, I mean, it may not be a robust assay, but they look, and there it is, it's stuck in there. So, you know, uh, you know it, it sure would be nice to talk a little bit sooner that time, but I, I, I think so. Uh, so, okay, the, um, any questions with what I said so far? I should have paid you to say that because you're going to lead me right down that path. So just hold on to that thought. But as far as the as far as forming prions, I just want to clarify that I'm not saying that they form prions like pathological prions in their normal day to day life. What I'm saying is that they're using a prion like domain that is the sort of switchblade tool for their function in the cell, their normal function in the cell. So they form P bodies and stress rings. Those are the really those are really the structures that they form using their prion like domains. You take away their prion like domains, they don't form those structures. But they have the potential to form the, the more pathogenic prion, yeah. exactly right. And, and so, but they don't that's not how, how they normally work, right? So um, you know uh, one of the things uh, that uh, is always uh, you know nice is when you find um, an article that articulates so I'm using this uh, as far uh, and, and these are things that I've been, you know, uh, talking about for a while. But I think that the um, this is a nice uh, illustration. So, you know, again, cell selected. Um, these mutations are in all your cells. Uh, you know, you still have these. Not only does it not affect all of your neurons, it affects some neurons, right? Which is a hallmark of, of these types, types of diseases. So one idea about why RNA a binding protein defects. The ability to bind to RNAs to transport them, to put them, to regulate them, to start granular free bodies, et cetera, to transport in and out of the nucleus. Um, the reason that, that neurons die when you have subtle defects in those kind of things is because they're wrong, right? Because they, don't have, they have to be built to live for all these years and all these things. And other cells, you know, you have a problem and it just turns over. Okay. So that's one possibility, that's that's one idea. I actually believe that you know we have evolved to live this long, and I think our nervous systems are quite robust in being able to, 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 to do this. So I don't think it's just that kind of thing. I think there it requires a defect, and maybe a defect in housekeeping or, 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 or I don't know. But this is one, but there's definitely a reason why neurons like to be thought to be normal and normal. And normal. Okay. Another is that neurons really because of their morphology and remember the long you know they actually have quite a lot of these p-bodies and rna granules and there are lots of different nomenclature for these things but to be honest it's just like people doing you know their ip experiments and isolating these things and then lists with mass spec we don't have an understanding it's a dynamic dynamic kind of thing but neurons really are populated quite a bit by local deposits of, of silent or repressed, uh, translational repressed um, messenger RNAs and microRNAs and other things that are important for a need to respond quickly and locally. And that's the, that's the thing that most cells don't have to deal with, liver cells don't have to deal with that. So that's another reason why maybe there, again, I don't know, maybe I, I think that you know, we have neurons and they've evolved they probably are built to be able to handle this kind of thing. But true, if you have a solid defect, maybe you can handle it. And then this is another thing that I also, that I that I very much like, and that is that, you know, in your liver, if 10% of your liver cells die, the other, they can go away. And it's not going to affect the, the function of those neighboring liver cells, but you know in the nervous system, connectivity matters. So that if you have a particular neuronal pathway that's going on, then you can only tolerate a certain percentage of the members of that network to, to degenerate before the function of that multi-neuronal network goes away. 
You guys know when we talk about you know muni and CNAP and denervation that motor neurons have the capacity, for example, the muscle to re innervate. So, you know, in a patient there's actually active denervation but re innervation going on simultaneously. That's a peripheral uh, example of the fact that there's regeneration going on. But if you have a network that is ultimately hooked up to the motor system or to the muscle bones or something like that, then it could be something that is distant from the cell that you're really worried about that, that starts to fail. So you're more vulnerable to the loss of those things. So yes, the nervous system has redundancy and it has the ability and it's plastic, so it is able to adapt. But the reason that we don't have like a photographic memory is because you know things immediately become uh, modulated and, and, and altered over time, and there is normal death going on in us, and that is a, 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 a and, and it accumulates over time. So maybe that's one of the reasons that uh, that we see neurons and motor neurons in particular that, uh, that are affected by this. Here is your question. We're going to go back now to the data that was released last week. And what they found was, I mean, so, so you guys now are like pros at why RNA binding proteins in particular seem to be linked to ALS and motor neuron disease because we know that they are uniquely sequestered in pathological inclusion, and that in a way, what one of their strengths, these triadic domains, is also their Achilles heel in the disease state, and that that is why these cells are vulnerable. But the cell, like I said, it's the it's it's like I've seen this before. It, it can do autophagy. It can. Uh, uh, we know that these are ubiquitated, uh, ubiquitinated in the uh, in inclusion. So degrade them. Uh, get them. Uh, get them. Uh, Degraded through uh, autophagy. Uh, of course, the neuroinflammatory cascade, which we know in a non cell autonomous way, especially is activated in uh, states of neurodegenerative disease and in ALS, of course. Uh, and it turns out that some of the new genes that they found were this TDK1, which is uh, really an important part of the activation of the inflammatory cascade and in the interaction of uh, inflammatory proteins with the autophagosomes. Primary proteins, the autophagosomes have been identified uh, so that this kind of is a parsimonious model for how you know problems in, in all of these pathways uh, uh, can uh, affect motor neuron disease. I don't know if you remember way earlier on when I was doing my primer on RNA metabolism, that there were these really orange proteins that each one of those sets, those all pose motor neuron disease. Not all ALS, some are, some are more lower motor neuron disease. But this and that help to illustrate to you that you know there's a lot, there's more than one way to skin the cat. Our genetics is filling in what the relevant pathways might be uh, in going on. And a lot of it starts with the sequestration of RNA binding. I'm going to take, I have a little bit of time, I'm going to take three slides to take a bit of a detour and use SNA as a teaching point to go farther than that to more downstream mechanisms because this is something, you know, I, I like to, uh, you know, the, you know, sip my snifter of brandy with my cigar, my evening jacket and say, well, you know, in SNA we knew about RNA metabolism all along, you know, because SNA is a, it, the, the, the gene that causes SNA, spinal muscular atrophy, a lower motor neuron selective uh, disease, developmental degeneration, is a central protein in the assembly of specific RNA uh, ribonuclear proteins. Um, and so here, you guys are already familiar with these non-coding RNAs that have to essentially interact with specific proteins to form Splice these almost terms. You guys with me, right? That plus that has to equal that. That that's how the splicing zone is made and how it works. We talked about that at the very beginning. This is just a different picture of it. We know a lot about how this happens, but the SNS protein, which is its expression, is reduced in uh, the, the, this this disease, spinal muscular atrophy. Um, it turns out to have an essential role in the assembly of this RNA with those uh, uh, SNRNAs with, with these uh, proteins. So you guys are probably by now familiar 
with this idea. I'm not going to go through this, but you can see that there's a handoff for recognition. There are RNA binding proteins like GEM5 that then call to other proteins. It's an incredibly complex but beautifully elegant dance to take this RNA, hold on to it, tell it where to go, put it with its right partners, get it to where it has to work, and then let it do its thing. It's amazing. I mean, it's awesome. It's really quite amazing. I need more coffee. So the one of the outcomes of that, okay, so these guys here have like different levers. There are specific, uh, specific sequences here and even specific protein combinations here that define different slightly normal uh, SNRPs. And the important thing here to look at, this is stuff that was done in our divergences lab, is that in mice that do not have uh, the uh, SMN gene in the background of having SMN2, these are the so-called severe SMN mouse model, which is sort of the backbone of a lot of research that's gone on in that, uh, has a reduction in the amount of that. And that makes sense. If SMN is here, and you have to make these, and if you reduce the throughput here, if you reduce this, you're going to have fewer of these. And that's basically uh, what this what this shows. And so Christine and Arthur, uh, you know, uh, in their review, nicely uh, postulated how a reduction in the ability to make these is slightly normal sooner. Or, and this is a key element, or something else, something other kinds of RNA protein complexes, which we know uh, SMN is also involved in, essentially can have downstream consequences that ultimately lead to motor neuron death uh, uh, that may be preceded by specific alterations in the synapse. Whatever that is, my point to you is that is that it, it's kind of a no, you know, obviously this is probably true, but we now know that there are specific um, gene expression changes and slicing events that occur. And I would have thought that it would have been a lot broad, broad, uh, uh, sort of broad based kind of thing. But uh, people like Corey and, and Arthur's lab are showing us that out that, and, and uh, that no, actually, they're really, it's a very selective you know, kind of thing. So imagine now going back to uh, our, our template. What if another protein kind of interacted with that? And it turns out that bus, bus is a splicing protein. It actually interacts with that U1 stir, okay? Because it does, it's part of the splicing zone. So U1, so SMN, Goes ahead and makes you know uh, makes the you sir and you're good to go. Bus meets up with that and everything's cool, right? Well, when you mutate bus to cause ALS, turns out you start to develop these inclusions out in the cytoplasm, which means that you have less bus available for uh, for this. Not only that, bus interacts pathogenically with SMN and sequestrates it, and actually takes it out of the picture. And what you end up having is less less production of the user. This is just just one example of the possible ways that these genes that cause motor neuron disease may interact with one another, cause similar downstream gene expression changes. Okay, this isn't like the strongest paper in the world, but it's a nice example of you know of, of a putative way in which you have an intersection. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I, I actually am skeptical about, you know, um, it, but what I would say is that uh, what I do believe is that motor neurons, and I think that that's, that's the thing about SMA that is so attractive to us, I think, because it's like a reestablishment. Rather than like this, I mean, there are there are misinterpretations, but 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 you can actually dial in a severity in a way that you can't, uh, you know, with some of these other kind of things. And it's going to teach us um, this kind of thing is going to uh, teach us about selectivity because you know one of the things that is damn sure is that it is that is very selective. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that, and, and it, because it is sort of a haplosufficiency 
you know, kind of situation. But remember that a lot of these dominant mutations, I think that what this kind of thing is showing us is that it, they may be actually acting in a haploid deficiency. So there's sort of either a toxic gain function of, 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 the, of, of specific RNA binding events, or because of the sequestration and this cascade of events that you have essentially a haploid deficiency of some kind of processing event that leads to downstream events. And I, what I look forward to is looking at gene expression changes in an SMN kind of case and gene express, downstream gene expression. Those are the types of things, because that's where we go for, this is maybe my next slide, yes. And that's where we go to the discussion uh, that we you know, have a little bit of time, I guess, for, which is how are we going to study this? How can we better study this and target those kinds of downstream topics? So Sharon can, you know, bust his heart. He was talking about that final kind of pathway back in the turn between the 1900s and the 2000s. Now we've done the 2000s to the, to the so no, 1900s to the 2000s, and we're entering this final common pathway on, on pathogenesis of the disease, the molecular pathogenesis of the disease, and I like to draw that parallel. So, you know, this gets back to this question. So one reason that I showed that RNA binding protein 45 in CSF and seeing it in the inclusion is because that is a, that is one example of how we could imagine a biomarker that may not have anything to do necessarily with pathogenesis can be monitored to help in, in a disease. Because I think we are all aware of the fact that we lack predictive biomarkers in, you know, in, in, uh, uh, in ALS that have a molecular underpinning. That's something that is a very, uh, would be a welcome and hot topic. The other thing is, why is it in this disease, and you know, I'm glad you brought up, brought up the distinction between SMA, because in ALS, you know, these patients, they just start to have weakness, and then it's just like a wildfire, and then they are dead, you know, and, and, and in the course of these, you know, on average two to five years. So, you know, it's it, it's really unlikely that all of my motor neurons were having accumulations of prion-like, you know, uh, domains in all of their cells for their, you know, for decades and decades, and then, you know, then one of them started to get so bad that the cell died. And then, just out of coincidence, the, 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 the cells that were near it, they were also filling up too, and, and so then they also got, that, that just can't be. So, I like, you know, I think that in, 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 the, in the field, you know, we, we definitely discuss the idea of this sort of tipping point. Of, there's something that happens, they talk about this in Alzheimer's, they talk about this in other degenerative diseases. There is something that at some point, like, when I talk about cases, like I use the metaphor of dominance, something hit that first domino. But then something else leads to the, the spread and the progression of the disease. So, you know, why, why does that happen? Well, we just talked about how what may even be a wild type protein that has a domain in it that is locked and loaded to do a certain function can be hijacked. And, and essentially be turned into an evil player in the progression within the cell. Well, of course, we also know that there is in neurons connectivity and there is exchange of cytoplasm. There's a lot of different ways. In fact, we know a lot that motor neurons with oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system and in Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system, if you've got a heat shock, for example, then you're not going to wait for your heat shock protein to be made in the nucleus and then travel down to Dayton. Be, to be expressed, you, and, and we, we now know that things like the the uh, the, the um, glial cells will actually secrete out and and deliver uh, heat shock proteins and other things uh, directly into the axon, so that you have localized, quick. I've got to have this now type of thing. Or does nerve injury, for example, one of the reasons that we're excited about uh, adding uh, a, a nerve injury model to our discussion. There may be, as you, as you might imagine, there may be one kind of therapy that you would have to prevent that first domino from going. But there are probably other types of therapy that might be totally different that are important for stopping the spread or progression of the disease. I doubt 100 years from now we'll have a therapy, unless we have a preventative therapy, which that's what's going on uh, all the time. I ask, and, and my question 
out there is you know, well, what kind of biomarkers, and I think we are in early days, but there's very exciting things going on. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, people are obviously very focused about these pathogenic um, uh, honey binding proteins. And, and then what do you target? I mean, do you target the prion domains? But they're kind of important, you know, for, for the normal cell. How, how do you know when you're going to dissolve an aggregate and when you're going to actually interfere with them? And here we have a very, I think, important lesson from the Alzheimer's field, where monoclonal antibody therapy was developed that actually helps to sequester, to, to essentially prevent and metabolize insoluble amyloid aggregates. I mean, this is right up our alley now, right? This is an insoluble aggregate that seems to accumulate. The monoclonal antibody therapy got rid of those things, went to clinical trial. In the patients, it made their aggregates go away, or not form, I should say, because we only have a pathological assessment, but they treated patients at fewer aggregates. Did it have any effect on their clinical dementia? No. So are we going to just target the inclusions? I don't know. I don't know if that's what it is. And that gets back to the thing where we can't just trust the fact that we see a little stress triangle or an inclusion and then say, well, let's see what's in that. That's what's important. Because these other things that, because of capital deficiency that's caused by that or other things, you can't necessarily predict. So those are my questions to us all, and that people are obviously looking at this in the lab, is how can we best look at downstream consequences without missing the opportunity to interfere upstream. Does that make sense? Element to the um, 
because it may be the non-neuronal cells that are actually needed for spreading that kind of thing. The problem is I like to use, in clinic I, I use the word wildfire because I don't know whether it's something that's a prion like this that is actually then delivered and then causes the cascade, or, or is it something that is uh, more local inflammatory. And, and as you can see of that one slide is that it's not like either or. It's not, it's not like a, um, it's not necessarily like, oh, it's just the astrocytes or microglia activation. It, it could be that all of those things are going on at the same time. But, but I think that the gut and that tells you that, that there's some kind of 